Now, generally, we take quotations <clears throat> right out of the book here, you know, and we discuss them. But before we go into that this week, I'd like to do something else. I'd like to suggest something you may not be doing. Now, you'll notice that at the bottom of every page, wherever there's a biblical quotation, the editor has taken the time to tell you where this quotation comes from. If it's 2 Chronicles 3, why, they don't just give you the quotation, they tell you where from. And all the way through, you have these quotations in the text, and although on the original letters, some of the quotations were not annotated at the bottom, in the book they are. And so let's not let that go unnoticed. In fact, to call it to your attention, what I've done then is I've taken a little sheet and I've just jotted down all of the quotations from the Bible in this chapter and where they're from. And the reason we're going to discuss them today instead of quotations other than biblical ones is I'd like you to develop this habit of reading. Our basic purpose is to overcome the false mortal sense of matter. And as you try to do that with your thinking mind, you're going to find failure is inevitable. These little words from the Bible are the way you do it. You grip hold of them just as hard as you can and you study them and you find that the words of Christ are the only way that you can overcome the belief in matter. In other words, your consciousness is at a crossroad. Here's the world mind life stream entering and here's the divine life stream entering. You've got the wheat and the tares. And to keep out the world mind, you must have truth in consciousness. So that every lie of the world mind that hits your consciousness hits a truth which nullifies that lie, rejects it, turns it away, and sends it back. So that it has absolutely no power in your consciousness to stay there or to persuade you or tempt you that you're in an imperfect universe. Truth in consciousness. Now what truth should you put in your consciousness? Do you know a better truth than the words of God expressed through the Christ? What good are my words? What good are the opinions of any human being? If I go not away, how can the comforter come unto you? The comforter is Christ in you. The words of Christ in you are the truth in consciousness. And until you can hear Christ in you, you must take Christ in the Bible because that was Christ in Jesus, that was Christ in prophets, that was Christ in Moses, and Christ in Joel Goldsmith. But basically Christ in you is your goal. And to lead you to Christ in you are the words of Christ out here in the Bible. You see, those words were put there for that purpose, to lead you to Christ in you. And how can you then ignore those words? Or even read them quickly and say, oh yes, that's true. That's not it at all. These aren't words to remember. These are words to be fed into your soul. Not to remember with your mind. These words fed into your soul become a living Bible and the world mind approaching you is unable to penetrate to defile or maketh a lie. The seeds of evil, of falsity, of disease and disaster that are presented to your subconscious mind at the unconscious level of your mind are placed there by the world mind, but there is no consciousness in you to receive them. And you do it all without effort. You do nothing. 
you do not concern yourself with world mind you concern yourself with truth in consciousness now a very interesting thing happened an individual said to me a very fine student one who has caught the meaning of the word do you believe he said that this is possible I have come to a realization that only the presence of God is here is that possible now that's a mighty important revelation only the presence of God is here but the question was is that right and I had to answer this way it was right when Jesus discovered it didn't you believe him did you have to prove it to yourself did you have to waste 50 years to prove it when it's the word of God given on this earth what are we waiting for are we going to spend more lifetimes proving that his words are the truth of course it's the truth but it was the truth 2,000 years ago when he said it and it was the truth 3,500 years ago when Moses said it and when Isaiah said it is there another God beside me I know not any I am that I am there is no other I and the Father are one because there is no other isn't that the revelation of the allness of the presence that the only presence here is the presence only the presence is present why should that come as a great surprise to us when it's been in scripture all this time and think of the time we could save and the effort and the suffering and the tribulation if we would simply say the Christ said it I don't want to prove it I want to live by it I'm not going to run around with a mind to try to spend 50 years to find out if it's true or not I could spend that 50 years living it out that's why these quotations from the Bible so vital you don't have to prove them are you going to prove that God told the truth they're given to you so that you can trust them now before you can hear them within yourself they're given to you out here in the Bible for you to hear them there and say amen so be it now that word of the father spoken through Christ in the Bible becomes your shepherd you follow it you believe it you act with total faith in it and it's going to lead you to the comforter within yourself there's no other way to find the comforter within first you accept the comforter without listen and you'll see what I mean take this one from Deuteronomy and these are all out of the first chapter called pure being thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart with all thy soul and with all thy might now we've heard that five million times but we don't understand the meaning of loving the Lord and you can tell by the things we do and say that we don't love the Lord to love the Lord our God means to accept a perfect God a perfect God doesn't make anything imperfect when you accept imperfection you're not loving the Lord thy God you're doing the very opposite you're saying the Lord my God did not create a perfect this or a perfect that and that's what the meaning of love was intended to counteract this human tendency with all thy heart mind and soul is the total acceptance that only God is there's nothing but divinity there's nothing but divine substance there's nothing but divine life that's how you love the Lord thy God humanly you might love somebody but say I love him but he's kind of a dunce when you get down to it 
But you couldn't do that about God. To love the Lord thy God is to accept the infinite perfection of God, to accept the total nature of God. You cannot love the Lord thy God and deny the perfect nature of God in any way. And so the minute you found an evil on the earth, you are denying the nature of God. The nature of God is to be all-knowing. When you found an evil, you were saying God doesn't know about this evil. Or even worse, you're saying here's the evil and God does know about it, but God's not doing something about it, so I will do it. We will form a movement to do this thing that God isn't doing. Because that's what God wants us to do. Now you know that's wrong. If God wanted it done, why would God ask you to do it? Why wouldn't it have been done? And it has been done. It has been done perfectly. And your acceptance of an evil that you are going to counteract is your unknowledge or lack of knowledge, your ignorance of the nature of God. There is no evil for you to counteract. Your belief that it's there is the way you are not loving the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul. You're denying the presence of God where you have found the evil. You're denying the omnipotence of God where you have found the evil. You can't say, I believe in God's nature as being omnipotent, but God isn't doing something about this condition. Now, omnipotence would have done something about that condition before you discovered it. So what have you discovered? You have been fooled by sense images. They're very real to you. So real that they make you not love the Lord thy God. They make you deny the omnipotence and omnipresence of God and the omniscience of God, the qualities of God. And so you have God permitting somebody to poison his people. You have God permitting somebody to pollute his atmosphere. But it isn't his atmosphere. That's why you think it's polluted, because you thought it was his atmosphere. It isn't. If it were his atmosphere, how could anybody pollute his atmosphere if God is omnipotent? It would be impossible. How could anybody suffer a disease of any kind if God were omnipotent? And so what you're saying then is, I have this thing, God is not omnipotent. Or you're going all the way out with a church message that God is punishing you, or him, or her. Or that stillborn baby, that God was punishing that baby too. And God was punishing that mongoloid, and that imbecile, and that one, and that one, and that one. Ridiculous, of course. There's nobody to punish. There's only God being. To love the Lord thy God then with all thy heart, mind, and soul means to accept that there's only God being. Then who are you? I and the Father are one. One being. Then who is sick? The image you have conceived of yourself because you are asleep and the world mind planted an image in your mind. And that mind being very versatile, a perfect mirror of the world mind, it showed it forth as a perfect reflection of the lie. A perfect Xerox copy of the lie. And you parade around and you say, I've got this. Where's God? Why isn't God taking it away from you? Why isn't God making you better? The simple reason is God has already done just that. God has already made you a perfect being. And so be ye perfect. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart by rejecting every idea, however it may seem total, that you are sick or suffering or lacking or anything of that nature. It's a lie. It isn't loving God. It's not understanding that to love God means to understand the nature of God. You cannot love what you do not understand. The nature of God is perfection in all things. The nature of God is one, one body. There's only one body. And it isn't sick. There's only one substance. It isn't sick. 
There's only one life. It isn't sick. What is sick? Nothing. N-O-T-H-I-N-G is sick. That's all that can be sick is nothing. And if you persist in thinking that the image is something, it can be sick. Because when you have an image that you think is something, that is what idolatry is all about. Now, you can take a dumb piece of stone or a dumb piece of wood and pray to that. Or you can take a dumb image and pray to that. Or you can go to the kingdom of God within you and you find you don't have to pray. The consciousness of the Father is your consciousness. The acceptance of that consciousness where you are as present, alive, alert, intelligent, all-knowing, all-powerful is your guarantee that right now here I am on holy ground. God is right here. The omnipotence of God is preventing any possibility to that perfection from being less than itself. The all-knowing mind is perfectly patrolling its kingdom right here. You're accepting yourself to be the essence of God. And his essence being pure, perfect forever. To love God is to accept that that which the Father is, his essence, I am, and therefore I am pure, perfect forever. You can't love God and not accept his substance to be your substance. That's the meaning of love fulfills the law. You're accepting God to be your substance, your very being. And then all of you that is not God, get out of it. Get out of the mind that is not God's mind. Get out of the body that is not God's body. Get out of the life that is not God's life. There isn't God life and your life. There's God life, the essence, the perfect essence, being your perfect life. The one you're living in that you think is imperfect is fiction. There is no such life. And that's the meaning then in Deuteronomy. And that's why when you come across a passage of the Christ, you must not remember it. You must take it into your consciousness and dwell with it. Now, if we were to go through this chapter or this book in 12 Easy Lessons, we would have a fine memory course. You can't take the word of Christ that quickly. You've got to abide with it. I must love the Lord my God. I must accept the Lord my God with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul. There's nothing left that I've got to accept with. Now, how can I accept anything else? There's no room except to accept the Lord. In other words, accept the allness of God. Do you see that change in consciousness that begins to demand of you? What else am I accepting beside the presence of God? That's got to go. The images out here are going to keep knocking at my door, needing help unless I get into this change of consciousness which recognizes only God is present the only presence on this earth is the presence of God only the presence is present only God is present deny it and you're not loving God with all your heart, mind and soul so instead of remembering the quotation remember the Christ of your being spoke it through Moses and so get back into your invisible consciousness take these phrases dwell there with these phrases explore them let them communicate to you open them up like a fan and examine every word Spend time with them. 
they will become your inner Bible. And then when you have fanned them out and let them speak to you, be still. And they will speak again in another tongue. In that stillness, they will be planted as seeds in your consciousness, just as the seeds of the tares were planted by the world mind. And let the lie come to you again. It will find that in you is the truth which nullifies the lie. And out there in the image world, you'll find the divine beginning to express in those images in your world the uninterrupted flow of the substance of truth in consciousness opens up the capacity of your consciousness to receive the living substance from the Father. The soul feeds you. The mind responding to soul no longer projects the duality of the world mind. You don't have to think and think and think and plan and plan these words will do it for you if you will live with them not in your mind but deeper they will take you to the above universe they are the messengers they are the way that the way shower uses to take you out of mind into soul And so that's why we're discussing them this carefully this time. Every time you see a footnote saying Luke 15, 27, if you pass it by, don't pretend to yourself that you read that chapter. You didn't. You read it like people read, but not like students of spirit. And that's why we don't read five books and say, I've read, all of, I've read five books of Goldsmith or I've read them all, we don't do it that way. We sip. We cogitate. We contemplate. We commune. We let these phrases become an integral part of our being. We let them rejoin the Christ within who uttered them in the first place. You see, these words and the Christ of your being are inseparable. They have never been divided. And they return to their source, which is Christ in you. And if you will follow them, you will be led right to the comforter within. Continue in my words, and you shall know the truth. These are my words. And they will lead you to the comforter who is the fountain of all truth. And you will find you take dominion over the world of images. Yes, even over the physical form. Don't think that we have just walked by and closed our eyes to the things that trouble us. We haven't done that at all. We've simply learned a better way to eliminate from our lives those things which are not of God. We're not blind to these things at all. We're so aware of them that the complete dedication of the message is to lead you out of this Egypt of the world mind in which diseases are, in which problems are. We're not unaware of their presence in the world of images. That's all it's filled with. But we don't have to live in them. We have an invisible paradise. And as we start to love that paradise we see why the father is greater than I you remember the tumbler in this chapter and the glass the glass is the substance of the tumbler one is a form and one is a substance the tumbler is the form the glass is the substance and Joe will use that to point out the meaning of the father is greater than I I the human self out here am the tumbler the Father is the glass. Translated spiritually, the Father is the essence and the Christ is the form. The essence becomes the form. And they are one. They are not separated. 
And so the Father and I are one, and the Father is greater than I. I am the essence of God made into form. What form? Not this visible form. Into the form which is made of essence. The essence of God is never visible. So I am spiritual form, formed of the essence of God, and that is my name. And if you listen to a world broadcast and you look at me, you will see a world broadcast in you which says that I am physical form, and you will believe it. And you will think that I am out here as physical form, and you will be listening to the false broadcast. I'm not out here as physical form, and if I look at you, you only seem to be there as physical form. You are the essence of God. That is your name. That is your substance. And the form of you is formed of that essence, and it isn't the form that my eyes can see, because my eyes are also part of the false broadcast. My very senses are part of the false broadcast. My very physical being is that false broadcast made into visibility. But inside, in my divine consciousness, loving the Father supremely, I can shake off the mortal myth. And you can shake off the mortal myth until you realize that you are standing in the presence of God every moment of your life. And that presence is the essence of your being. Honor it. Love it. And everywhere you look, accept only it. Not the pollution, not the poison, not the disease, not the lack, not the limitation. Do not honor them by believing that the image world is real. And come back to the mind that was accepting them as real and see that the mind which accepts them is also part of the image world. That little brain, which is aware of that which God did not create, is nothing more than an image. It, too, is part of the world broadcast. All of this is to lift us out of the level of human mind into the acceptance of these words, which are the words of truth, and we steadfastly hold to their truth instead of the truth that the human mind tries to bring to us. Why? Because the truth of the human mind is this inner flow from the world mind and we catch it at that level. Put a little box around it and look at it right inside there and you can see why you could say to Pilate, thou hast no power. Pilate was just a television broadcast to him. Can you fear something on television? Put a box around it. And look at it. That's what the world mind is broadcasting to you all around you. It has no power. It can't step out of the box. There is no other power than the power of the one. The essence of God is where the power is. And nobody is pushing that power aside. Now then, you have the power of that essence, which is omnipotence. And so there's nothing that can enter, that can be powerful over omnipotence. There's no other power. There's only the power of good, of perfection. And the broadcast fools you because it comes out sometime so close to home that you think it's real. Now these phrases become very meaningful and potent as you see that not just sentences written by an author they are the word of substance. You can trust these phrases. And you can look at whatever you see and know that because God is present and God is the power, that power is maintaining its own essence right here. I am perfect now as my Father. And nothing in the world can ever change that. Nothing. There can be a lot of broadcasts, a lot of images saying that I'm not, but nothing can change the fact that I am as perfect as my father. Nevertheless, because the tumbler is always made of the qualities of the glass, and the child of God is always made of the qualities of the essence of God, so I cannot be less than my father. 
For if I think I am less, then I am not loving God supremely. Because who is there to be less if God is one? What other one is there to be less? How could you be less than God if God is one? I and the Father are one. There's a secret in so many ways. When you and the Father are one, in your consciousness, you are accepting his statement. Not you're going to become one. His secret was learning that I and the Father are one. Now, you could spend another 50 years to prove it. Or you could simply say, I and the Father are one. Now, what about me is unlike God? Whatever is, is not that one. This arm isn't like God. It can't be my real arm. The brain isn't like God. It can't be your real brain. Your body isn't like God. It can't be your real body. You're out in the image world. Use that image to its advantage, for its purpose. Wherever it is imperfect, take yourself back to your invisible consciousness. Now out here there's arthritis. In your invisible consciousness there must be a belief in arthritis. Do you see that? There must be a belief there, or it couldn't be out here. This out here body is the mirror through which you see your invisible consciousness. And the belief is in your invisible consciousness. Now why waste time out here with liniments? Or with electrical heating? That's relief. Get rid of the belief down here. How do you do it? That's what these words are. Do you believe in here that you can have arthritis or do you love the Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, and soul? Do you love the essence of God? Do you accept it as your essence? Does it have arthritis? Can it have arthritis? No, but it is my essence. All right, take these two and sit there until you accept that essence and not the conscious belief that you can have arthritis because the you that can have it is saying I'm not that essence. You see how you come down to the point where you've got to face it. I'm either that essence of God or I'm accepting myself as something else. And as long as you're something else, you're in the world. And the world is not God's creation. And you're asking for trouble. A greater Iniquity can come upon you. And a greater one, and a greater one, and a greater one, because the one and only sin is not knowing and believing and accepting and trusting that you are the essence of God, and therefore the mind which denies it is a liar, and you will not listen to that mind, but you will listen within yourself. For I am the Father, our one essence, today, now, this minute, forever, before Abraham and after the world. Continuous essence of God is your name. You can be no other. Every word then is to make you consciously drop every belief that denies who you are. In Matthew 5, 48, be ye perfect even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. Now there's the statement that God is perfect. God is perfect. 548 Matthew. But God is the substance of your being as revealed also in I and the Father are one. Now how can you be imperfect if you're one with the perfect God? To go on believing you can be is to deny the truth. You suffer from the lie. You cannot be imperfect, and whatever appears to be imperfect where you are is a lie. The suffering isn't happening. The pain isn't happening. It's happening in this distortion of image. Get out of the image, back into the consciousness, the consciousness has received a seed or a tear, a lie, below the level of your knowledge, and now it's showing forth as an imperfection. But use the truth in consciousness. 
God is perfect. I and the Father are one, therefore I and perfection are one. How could imperfection enter perfection? It wouldn't be perfect if imperfection could enter it. I am perfect. Now why am I not experiencing that perfection? Because I haven't quite accepted that God is the only creation, the only power, the only substance, the only law, and I must do it again and again and again in consciousness until something springs up inside me, a great knowing. This isn't something I have to make happen. It's the isness of being now. Let's conclude today's class now with a meditation letting the fullness of what we have learned permeate our being.